Good evening. My name is Richard McSherry. I'm the pastor of the Shaftesbury Methodist Church, and we're just glad to be with you this evening, this Christmas Eve, when we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to thank the folks from First Baptist who have been with us through this Advent season um, and until now on Christmas Eve to, to film our services in their church, and we want to thank them so very, very much for that. We want to welcome you as well, and we hope that you have a very happy, very merry, very joy-filled Christmas at this time. Let's turn to God in prayer at this time. Gracious God, here we are at long last. Our Advent waiting is over. Christ is born. Hallelujah, Lord. We just rejoice in this great good news that our Savior has come to us. He's come to us in our need and in our loss and in our sorrow. He's come to us in all that we need. We thank you for that. As we come into worship, Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will guide, direct all that we say and do. For we ask this through Christ our Lord, born this night. Amen. And at this time, we'll have our gathering song. At this time, we'll have the lighting of our Advent wreath. And I'll share with you the scripture, which is from Luke's Gospel, getting in the second chapter. In those days, the days of Caesar Augustus, a decree was issued that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place where Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. And so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee in Judea to Bethlehem, the town that he belonged to because he was of the house and lineage of David. He went there to register with Mary, um, who was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the child to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in cloths, and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And suddenly there were shepherds living out in fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. But the angel said, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy to all people. For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign unto you, you will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the heavenly host a multitude praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. On this most holy day, we light all four candles in our Advent wreath. And we're reminded of the expectation, preparation, proclamation, and revelation of his coming. Now, as we light the Christ candle, we rejoice that the promise of God has been fulfilled in the coming of the baby born in a manger.
Let us pray. Gracious and mighty God, we celebrate your goodness to all of us as we join in the triumph and joy of Christmas. As your love has been re revealed to us in all its fullness, we pray that love may abound in our hearts as well this special day, and not to remain in those hearts, but that that love can go out to those around us, neighbors, friends, and even those who we've never met. We pray, O oh God, that we will share the joy of Christmas which is Jesus, with those around us. For we ask it in his precious and holy name. Amen. Mm. At this time, we're going to have our Christmas responsive reading, and Sue is coming forward for that. And that's at the back of our bulletins here. And this is based on uh, the Gospel according to John with some well-known carols and other readings. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. O come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. O come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. O oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. He came to that which was his own, but his own would not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. O oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. O oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. O oh, come, let us adore him. Christ, Christ the Lord. The Lord. Our first hymn is, O Come All Ye Faithful. that time of prayer when we want to bring our joys to the Lord, our, especially the joy of this wonderful gift of his son Jesus Christ for, for which we return praise. We also want to bring our concerns to the Lord as well. So let's turn to God in prayer at this time. Gracious God, we are rejoicing in this season of Christmas and the, the fulfillment of your promise, the promise given to prophets and sages from ages past, fulfilled perfectly in the manger of Bethlehem. 
We thank you, Lord, for filling all of your promises to your people and to us individually and personally. We thank you, God, for the joy of the season, the traditions of the season, the hymns and songs and carols of the season, and in all the many ways in which we rejoice because of the birth of your son, Jesus. Lord, we look around and we have a very troubled world in which we live. And so we pray, Lord, for that world. We pray that that message of peace on earth and goodwill will just expand around the globe. We know you, all, you love all people. You, we know that you are not willing that any should perish, as your word tells us, but all should come to everlasting life through Christ. We lift up families, Lord, especially families that cannot be together this season. We lift up those who are lonely. We lift up those who are in want. We lift up those who need an encouraging word. And we just pray, Lord, that you will put these people in our paths so that we can become those agents of divine encouragement for them. Lord, we pray that through this Christmas day, we'll be mindful of all that you've done for us, even as we pray the words our Savior taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, for those of you who've joined us before, we've um, had cr uh, children's Christmas moments and we focused on customs and traditions from various parts of the world. And as we conclude tonight, uh, I want to uh, focus a bit on the uh, customs of the German-speaking lands of Germany and Austria, Switzerland, those, those places in Europe. And so many of our customs that we share in this country come from that part of the world. Uh, the Advent wreath, for instance, uh, the Christmas tree. So many things come from that part of the world. And an interesting note is the Christmas tree was brought first to England by Prince Albert, who married Queen Victoria in the 19th century. And when he came over, he brought some of those beloved customs with him. And, and in Buckingham Palace, they, they erected a beautiful Christmas tree. And it was posted, there was a picture on one of the famous publications of that day showing this, this tree and the royal family gathered around and, and people were so awestruck that soon others in England began to, to put up Christmas trees as well. And then it, it crossed the pond, as they say, it crossed the North Atlantic and it came to our shores and people began to, to display Christmas trees. And it just shows that interconnection with, with all of God's people, whatever nation they come from. And so we have the, the German lands to thank for so many of the beautiful and beloved customs that we enjoy today. And that tree reminds us of the tree of life. It reminds us that Jesus gave his life, as they say, on the tree, on the cross, for each and every one of us. And that is why he came for that first Christmas. And so as we rejoice, we can think of those things. Our next hymn is Hark the Herald Angels Sing Glory to the Newborn King.
we come to that time of our service when we want to bring our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. And as you contemplate all that God gave us on that first Christmas Eve, the great joy he brought to the shepherds, to the innkeeper, to all of those who gathered that night, he brings to us. And may we return a worthy portion of what he's given us for the work of his kingdom so that others may know the great joy and the reason for the season. Amen. Time we'll have our scripture reading and our Psalter reading is number 150, the very last easy to find psalm in scripture, 150. Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise God in his mighty firmament. Praise God for his mighty deeds. Praise God for his exceeding greatness. Praise God with trumpet sound. Praise God with lute and harp. Praise God with tambourine and dance. Praise God with strings and pipe. Praise God with sounding cymbals. Praise God with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And our scripture reading is from the Gospel according to John. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as a father's only son, full of grace and truth. 
John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is only God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known to us. And may God bless the reading of his holy word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This particular reading that, that Susan shared with us, this reading from John's Gospel, is considered the great lesson. Because here we have the revelation of who this baby in the manger really and truly is. And now at last that Advent waiting is over. The day that we have been waiting for is here at last. And innkeeper, shepherds and angels and even cattle in the stalls bear witness to the one who created all things and now is lying in a manger. Amazing, incredible. Only God could imagine such a divine encounter with his people. The Hebrew people were a people of the word. In Deuteronomy 6, 4-9, we find the central creedal statement of Judaism in one verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Note that first word, hear. In Genesis chapter 1, Verses 1 and 3, we read from the story of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God speaks, and all of creation comes into existence. The Almighty simply needs only speak, and all that there is awakens to life. This concept is unique to the witness of Israel. The words of John's Gospel here in the New Testament mirror those of Genesis in the Old. The third verse of chapter 1 in John's Gospel tells us that all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And so we see that Jesus was very much present at the dawn of creation and actively involved in that creating process. And now the very one present at creation makes himself vulnerable for our sakes. And we find him lying in a manger surrounded by cattle in an obscure village that the vast majority of the world had never taken notice of. Indeed, if it was not for this birth on this day, very few would have heard of that little town of Bethlehem. If this God who can lie in a manger in Bethlehem and can be held in the arms of Mary, guarded by Joseph, watched by shepherds, if this God can do that, he can enter your heart as well and live and abide with you. In spite of who we are, where we come from, or what we have done, this God of the manger wants to live in and with us each and every day and for eternity. Amazing. Amazing indeed. The prophet Isaiah said, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity and whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who is a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God, as one author points out, reaches down from his throne to people who are humble in heart. 
The Almighty God reigns supreme in the universe. He judges humanity with fairness and mercy. He's exalted and righteous above all powers, natural as well as supernatural. And God alone is worthy of worship. No wonder he dwells in that high and that holy place. But that holy place, that place set apart for a very special purpose, is not in a heavenly celestial palace. That holy place where God Almighty chooses to dwell is in the contrite and humble heart of the believer. God does not dwell, the Bible tells us, in buildings made of stone, but he does dwell in the human heart. We are never more exalted than we are humble before our Creator and our Sovereign King. And that attitude of humility begins with listening. Listening for God here, O Israel. And we need to stop and listen if we are to hear what the Lord would have for us. And not simply listening with ears, not listening just with ears, but with our hearts as well. And you know, when we listen to God, we begin to hear, really hear others as well. And as we listen to God, we love God even more. And as we listen to others, we begin to love them as well. We don't have to agree with them. We don't have to see eye to eye with others. But nevertheless, we can love them with a divine and passionate, holy love. Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, just as our hope for God begins with listening to God's word, the beginning of love for Christians is learning to listen to them. Remember this, she said, when people choose to withdraw far from a fire, that fire continues to give warmth, but they grow cold. We need to listen to God's word, the Bible, and all that it has for us. And we need to respond with those very words as Jesus did when he said, Not my will, but thine be done. Jesus, you see, the Bible tells him he's the living word and our supreme exemplar in all things. We have the Bible, God's written word, but we have Jesus who's the living embodiment of that word. When you think about the major characters in the Christmas story, there are those who stopped and listened and responded in the affirmative. We see them again and again from the beginning of that story until this moment in Bethlehem. Mary was given the word through the voice of an angel and what did she say? Be it done unto me according to your word. And her, her spouse Joseph who we must confess had his doubts initially. Nevertheless, when visited in a dream, he responded in obedience to the will of God and took Mary as his wife. And the shepherds heard the good news of peace on earth. And what did they do? They left what they were doing. They left their everyday tasks and they went and they hurried to the stable. Again and again in Holy Scripture, the people of God are called to hear, but not just to hear, but to respond to what they've been told. One biblical scholar reminds us, the spoken word to the Hebrew was fearfully alive. It was a unit of energy charged with power. In the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, we read, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is the discerner of thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's the power of God's holy word. It's unlike any other word in existence. In the incarnation, we see that power expressed in an infant's cry and a mother's prayer. In the sixth chapter of John's gospel, we're told, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness to the light that all through him might believe. You see, John was sent to point the wor world to Jesus. John did not point to himself, very much on the contrary. He always kept the focus on Christ. And you know, that's our call as well. We're called to keep our eyes on Jesus and to point to any and all to the one who is the way and the truth and the life. This has been a very challenging year. I 
overheard someone recently say they can't wait to see the end of 2020. I think many can echo that sentiment. And we're feeling the effects of it even now, the social isolation, the loss of loved ones, plans changed, friends and family unable to, to gather together. All of this and so much more has taken its toll. But there are things that all of us can do in order to, to push back the darkness. We do not need to give in to despair. We, along with John, can bear witness to that light which pushes back the darkness in our lives. As the Gospel said, true light which gives light to everyone coming into the world. 19th century preacher and pastor Charles Spurgeon said, I would go to the depths a hundred times to cheer a downcast spirit. It is good for me to have been afflicted that I might know how to speak a word in season to one that is weary. Out of our struggles, challenges, and difficulties, we can encourage others. And the thing is, you don't have to have all the answers. Sometimes we sort of think, well, I've got to have all the answers right there, ready to go when I'm, when I'm dealing with someone. You need to only know where to point the others for the answers. Just as John pointed, not at himself, but at Jesus, we too point others to Christ. In 2 Timothy, we read, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me, in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. We're all on this journey of faith together, all of us. It's not a solitary solo thing. We need each other. If we've learned anything in these past 10 months, it is certainly that we have learned that we need each other. How long will our journey be? It's difficult to say. But what we can do is to listen to listen for that still small voice, to bear witness, and to serve. And along the way, there will be others who join us as we travel together, others who are touched by the word, filled with the spirit, and enlightened by the Lord. Those are the ones who respond to that great invitation of Christ when he said, but as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. We want to respond in faith. We want to respond in trust and confidence in that God who has promised will fulfill those promises. I'd like to close with a poem by Nick Kenny entitled Miracle Road. How many miles to Bethlehem, dusty and long was the road, as the little donkey stumbled along bearing his precious load. How many miles to Bethlehem? A blind man wept at their plight and was blind no more than the tears of joy he followed the star so bright. How many miles to Bethlehem? The onlookers' hearts beat fast, watching the sick and the lame made whole where Mary and Joseph had passed. How many miles to Bethlehem? It isn't so very far, for Christ is reborn in each loving heart that follows. Christmas star. We want to wish you all a very blessed and Merry Christmas and a wonderful new and exciting year in him. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, you have shown us the light, you have shown us the way, and may we in turn show others that same way. May we bear witness to the light which has so enlightened us and may we share the love that you have with us, with everyone around us, for we ask it in Jesus' name, our newborn King. Amen. At this time, we'll have our final hymn of praise, which is Silent Night, Holy Night.
So oh.